since this, this discussion is more focused on what we can do to fix things, uh, I ask the panelists to identify only one urgent problem uh, with education that they could do something about, and, uh, and why isn't it being fixed already? Um, well, I would have to say it's investment and respect. Um, I know that Kurt mentioned Finland, and I actually had the pleasure of working with a couple of teachers from Finland a couple of years ago. And um, when I asked them uh, how their parents and the communities were invested in the schools, uh, their answer was just simply fully. Everyone is invested fully. All teachers, all students, all families, all communities are invested fully. Um, so essentially what they meant by that is that um, there wasn't this constant, like, you know, vilifying of teachers, that everybody was all in. It wasn't just like those, you know, super teachers that are all in all day long. It was all the kids, all the teachers, all the parents, the entire community, the media, the entire country was all in because they realized the importance. Um, so I think that if this country is to be all in, to be invested like that, it means that we absolutely, positively need to respect the professionalism of the school community for what it is and have those open lines of communication and have that collaboration that Kurt was mentioning. When parents and teachers and administrators in the school community has the time to collaborate and really come up with solutions to problems, interventions for kids that are struggling, behavior interventions and workshops for parents on the weekend, whatever it is to fully educate and not just teach to the test, not just teach from, you know, 7.30 to 4, or whatever time or school day is. It's being fully invested in education, whether it's you're the teacher, you're the student, or you're the family. And that's something that can easily be fixed. Um, we can stop, you know, putting on the news the stories of, you know, negative things that happen in school. We can find our star teachers, we can find our star principals, we can find our star students, our star parents, and we can start kind of making them rock stars, in essence. Because once you kind of, what we call at the school where I teach is, we make, you know, being smart cool. We coolify following the rules. We coolify um, being an academic achiever, having critical thinking skills, um, doing inquiry in the classroom. And that's what we make cool. And because of that, you know, our kids are invested. So if you have the time to collaborate, truly collaborate, as the entire community together, that's when success starts to happen. And part of that is really supporting teachers, principals, and students. And what that means is getting behind them, not vilifying them in the media, not talking down about how the unions are holding things up, but really like finding those great educators, finding what works, and spreading it. Giving people the forum to be able to learn from one another freeing up teacher time so they can observe one another, find that teacher who's the rock star, find out what they're doing, and learn from it, truly collaborating. Like, it's only when you're a complete team that it's going to work. And that includes, you know, media coverage of teachers. That includes the public's perception of the school and, you know, finding out what works. And collaboration is really the most urgent issue and because I feel like there's a lot of stratification you know teachers who are kind of cut off from parents or parents who are unable to be involved if there's some way some forum it could even be something online it could be YouTube clips it could be you know putting tutoring sessions online any of those things that collaborate and bring the entire school community can only benefit everybody I'm going to start with the short answer and then I'm going to explain how I got to that answer uh, as I go through. And the short term answer would be to end the testing madness now. Uh, assessment for learning is really valuable. Constant testing that's not tied to instruction is a total waste of time. And when I was a floor manager at a sorting hub for one of the largest shipping companies in the country, we didn't take out days of assessment in the process of some that system. It's collected and used for the how we are building. It is still busy. We took two days out of testing from sophomore and juniors. We lost six hours of instruction, an entire day of instruction just this week. And was it worth it? According to those who make policy, they'd say, yeah. And they say the same about those schools that through Scantron, Plan, Explore, PSAE, ACT, and any other interim exams, lose up to 16 days a year of instruction. We could have a longer school year and the same data by cutting down on testing and integrating similar and happy assessments into instruction. I don't know I don't know. Why not? You actually. Especially with testing, you can get data. 
The whole testing thing might be easier to take if the test was effective at doing what it claims to do. But an ACT is not designed to compare schools, but to test college readiness. And even then, it's a bad predictor. Because it doesn't measure personal initiative or, you know, or can, or a lot of other things. It doesn't, you know, or it doesn't have access to funding. Should we really be testing 11th graders to see if they can read at a college sophomore level? That's the ACT readability section on levels of the reading test. Okay? They shouldn't necessarily be able to do that work because they haven't had the training on how to do it. A bigger issue is a way in which testing narrows the curriculum. Broadly speaking, anything that draws on creativity is out. It's not on the test, so it doesn't, it's not held to be important. And different interpretations of events are out too. We don't talk about, well, what's your perspective on this and what's your perspective on this. The test just has one right answer that can be followed in. And even within a skills area, the test is limiting. ACT, reading passages, measure vocabulary knowledge, ability to draw conclusions, main ideas, and relationships like cause and, cause and effect and sequence. They're important, no doubt. But the problem is that literacy is so narrowly focused, this does our students a serious disservice. How do they find bias in an article? How do they assess multiple sources? What happens if a text isn't a print text, but rather a podcast or a movie or an interactive web experience? We don't test those. What happens with writing? What about public speaking and defending your ideas like we're doing right now? As a social studies teacher, I firmly believe it is my job to teach students how to read better, including all the ACT skills and the wider elements of what it takes to be literate. It would be helpful to have a scheduled time available to do this. This testing also limits experiential learning. Project organization, problem solving, and teamwork aren't measured by a standardized test, but those are crucial qualities for a modern workplace. Look at Apple computers. It's the most valuable country in the planet, and it's organized to maximize these skills. But those skills are not easy, easily quantified and turn into an easily digestible soundbite or, de excuse me, decontextualized statistic. So we pretend that a paper and pencil bubble test is a reasonable approximation. Uh, the bigger issue is very similar to what Jen talked about. It's an actual commitment to funding equitably. Schools are committing. That's a conversation that requires far more time to the details than I have. Uh. Yes, some, uh, it's amazing that uh, you picked the very issue that I wanted to uh, also talk about. <laughs> which, you know, you said, well, we could do immediately. I mean, in my mind, okay, you could immediately repeal No, no Child Left Behind. Or you could agitate towards its repeal because it's a totally, it's not only useless, but it's harmful to the educational experience. <laughs> of our children in the public school. I, I believe that the data he mentioned is out there clearly indicates that it's harmful. It's harmful because they're, 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 they're spending a whole lot of time learning things that are essentially they're gonna forget immediately. And they're useless in the long run in terms of being educated and learning how to deal with society and deal with issues now. So we're spending all this time doing that. And more, it's harmful in another way because it's used as a measure to punish the schools that don't, that don't reach the certain level that they say. In fact, as I alluded to earlier, I think our, our, our president is coming to realize, or the people in the head of this, this nation are coming to realize how harmful it is because they set a deadline that they know they're not going to be able to meet in terms of no child that's behind. So I think, so, so I agree with you totally. I couldn't agree with you more. That in terms of an eat, in terms of an immediate problem, and you know, I think that it's much bigger than that. But in terms of one problem that we could probably address immediately, it would be to try and urge our congressmen, to write our congressmen, to write every elected official, to make every type of noise that we possibly can, to say, repeal no child left behind. Repeal, I'm not saying modify it. Repeal it, it serves no useful purpose whatsoever. Repeal no child left behind, because it's not only useless, but it is harmful. Well, I've had a chance to my after being the first person to speak, now I've been able to listen to everyone speak twice. And, and as I listened, I, I, I wrote some comments down here. And I, I, I think what you talked about in terms of injustice and the, uh, the class differences, uh, I think we should also be adding the private schools in Chicago to this conversation. Because there's another wave of inequity of people who have greater wealth who don't even put their kids into the public system. And, and that, uh, if we map that part of the problem, there's a whole bunch of people that don't even get exposed to this thing we are talking about. And therefore, they're not engaged either. That's one comment. Uh, second thing is, is that uh, uh, when I use my map of Chicago here, uh, 
it showed in Chicago is the fourth largest school system or the third largest school system in the country. There's over 400,000 kids in the public system. New York City has about a million kids. Los Angeles has about 750,000 kids. The 10 largest cities who each have over 100,000 kids in the system have bureaucracies and have poverty areas that are so much larger than other cities and communities all over the country. The problems are dramatically different because of size. And we need to understand that. And that means that we, we need to be obviously having two conversations. How do, how do we solve education in the big cities? How do we solve education elsewhere? Maybe how do we solve education in the rural areas would be another conversation. There's so much, I, how, how many of you ever read the book about 10 years ago by, uh, uh, 15 years ago, Mary Beth Vanderweel, talking about, uh, uh, she did a, a, a newspaper a, a survey for the previous 20 years, talking about uh, five different issues, politics and unions, all kinds of different problems with the schools. This was right when Paul Dallas came in. Uh, and when you read the book, I, I, I remember meeting Paul when he was first uh, 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 CEO of Chicago Public Schools, and I said, I walked into his office after reading that book, I said, I don't know how you can solve this problem. Because while you might try to solve it here, you're, it's, it's also over here. And you have to even address the problem in all places at the same time, and we're not doing it. Uh, and then a couple years ago, Charles Payne wrote another book talking about uh, there, there's so many different competing agendas in all the different schools. Uh, all the things we want might happen if we could get everyone on the same page for 10 or 20 years to try to make it happen. But we have never been able to do that very well. So it's, it's all wishful thinking. So my, my, I, I, I keep talking about the night school hours and the school hours. I, I use a, a chart. I, I, I can't see it very well, but it's a timeline uh, from a, a preschool to work. And it has three, uh, uh, the yellow across the top would be the, the school, the 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock, 9 months a year. Uh, the two time frames down below would be right after school, 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Uh, and then after work or on the weekend. Well, after working on the weekends is the time frame when volunteers are coming and going from work to where they could be available as extra tutors, mentors, and people involved uh, if there were places for them to make that connection. Well, in this chart on, on one side, uh, down here, I, I talk about a push system. Every one of us is an adult at some level in our lives who has gone through this process, and we know that if kids would just listen to what we say they ought to do, their lives would be great. <laughs> Magically, they, I got kids at home, and they would just listen, their lives would be great. The problem is they're not listening, and as they get older, they're listening less, and depending on what the influences are around them, they're listening even less. And, and, and if you live in a high poverty neighborhood where you're, where do you get food and how do you dodge the gang and all these other kinds of things, you're not even thinking about your education. I've had too many kids tell me, Dan, I don't even think I'm going to be alive at 21. Why is this important to me? This other end is what I call the pole. This is the business community. The people who run businesses in this community are the people who stand to lose the most or gain the most from an educated workforce. And, and, and those are people who, with their volunteers, with their dollars, with their jobs, could be influencing what happens and why kids stay in school and what experiences they have. And make, and, and make it relevant, make it important, if they were doing more than pointing fingers or doing superficial type strategies. So my one recommendation uh, uh, to the group here is instead of having one fixed education committee, have two. Have one that focuses on what happens at the school. And have the second one focus on what the rest of us can be accountable for that affects what happens in the community around the school that influences how those kids come to school and how they go to work after school. And that could be while they're in high school, or it could be while they're in college, or it could be after they've gotten college when someone opens the door to a job because they know someone who works there. If, if you get 
one group thinking of that thing and the other group focusing on this close, I would wager that the one group focusing on what the rest of us could do could come up with an awful lot of different solutions and accountabilities that might have a great deal of influence over time on how well schools are able to do what they're doing.